The following presentation was recorded at the 2011 Southeast Linux Fest in Spartanburg, South Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond and Platinum sponsors in 2011 for helping make these videos possible. So, are there questions? Does, does anyone know what this stuff is, by the way? Is there, anyone ever heard of Workbench before? But you don't know what it is. You've heard of it, but you don't know what it is. That's awesome. That's what we want. We're actually at Palantir doing a, this is sort of our dog and pony show. Um, and I'll say this because I heard someone, as I, when I first got here this afternoon, someone was saying, well, I went to some of the Drupal stuff in the morning, but it was like a sales pitch and it really made me angry. This is Linux. It's all free and shared. shared and why, why would anyone give a sales pitch? Um, it's a dog and pony show, but it's not a sales pitch because we're not selling an actual product. The, the funny thing is that one of the other guys at Palantir is giving this exact same presentation at the exact same time in Colorado, at Drupal Camp Colorado. He starts just at the same time I do. So that's kind of fun. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what Workbench is, um, why we created it, how it's released, how it's managed. Um, and then I'm going to show you what it does and how it might make your life easy. How many of you, by the way, have to do um, end user support for your Drupal sites? Okay, you're going to love this stuff. <laughs> because I think that's where the, the sweet spot is. For, for Workbench stuff, I think our, our sweet spot for people who would want to use this are folks doing end user support, um, user experience experts who don't like Drupal interfaces, <laughs> Um, and developers, um, and developers who are trying to appease the first two groups, really. So let's just launch into it. Um, I'll give you a little bit of background. Ooh, I forgot I had fancy transitions and stuff. Uh, <laughs> so this is, this is my great, hey, what do you do? People come and they ask me, I I'm a Drupal developer. I've been doing this stuff for a long time. Um, I actually um, made some manner of history, and I'm in South Carolina, so I can say it. I take responsibility for launching the first newspaper industry website on Drupal. It was Bluffton today in Bluffton, South Carolina, lovely uh, coastal town right across the river from um, Hilton Head. Bluffton exists because Hilton Head is full. You can't buy land on Hilton Head. There's none left. Um, uh, so yeah, Bluffton today launched on Drupal 4.5 very briefly and then moved to 4.6. Then we did Savannah Now, Savannah, Georgia, et cetera, et cetera. And this was all way back in the dark, the dark ages of 2005, 2006. Um, real early adopter stuff. Um, now I work for a company called Palantir uh, out of Chicago. Um, and when people ask me, what do you do? I say, oh, we build websites for institutional nonprofits. Okay, well, what the heck does that mean? Um, museums, we do a lot of museums. Um, we do a lot of university work. Um, and we do a lot of work with now um, uh, public broadcasting and um, other publishing organizations. So that's, that's really interesting. And it, it plays in a little bit to what we're going to talk about and why we take certain approaches. Um, how many of you, by the way, work for what I would just call institutional nonprofits, like universities and such? Okay. Um, so, good example, Chicago Public Media. Uh, Chicago Public Media is one of the properties I can talk about. Um, they produce a lot of the stuff you hear on NPR, like what do you know? That's Chicago Public Media. Um, big, fun stuff. Um, this American Life, that kind of stuff. Um, I should point out, Chicago Public Media actually was built on Drupal 7.0. It wasn't even an alpha. <laughs> um, they built opensource.com, which is Red Hat's community website. Uh, it's kind of a fun little project. Um, this, is, this is the slide I want to, to grab your attention with. How many of you are familiar with working in this type of organization with a massive, and this isn't terribly complicated as it, for an org chart because there's not a lot of cross references, um, but does this sort of org chart look familiar to you? How many of you like work in LDAP environments where you have to manage this type of permission structure? Right? Have you ever tried to map this type of permission structure onto a CMS? You, you've never even tried? You just give up, don't you? Oh, you just haven't gotten there yet. Well, we beat you to it. So um, this is sort of my joke slide, though. We, we deal with a lot of these kind of inst institutions. We just built a website, and I'll show you here in a second, um, for, ah, darn. See, 
we had six different versions of this presentation. We just built a website for a university that I'll talk about here in a second um, that has a massively complex infrastructure. And that affects their publishing workflow. It affects their editing workflow. Um, it affects everything about their, their information architecture. And it's very, very challenging in a lot of systems to be able to map that architecture back onto to, to it. And I'm not just talking about Drupal. Um, so common, common problems that, that our clients come up with. Um, how do I section off parts of my website? We can take the Southeast Linux conference uh, website, for example. There might be a volunteer whose entire job is to update the videos section of the website and create new videos pages whenever possible. Now, you can do that by giving them a content type and saying you can only create this content type. But what if they have to create things that aren't just the video content type, but you still want them just over in this little section? Um, there are some ways to do it. You can use organic groups. That'll do it. Um, but organic groups doesn't give you the sort of access permission hierarchy that we were just looking at, where you have the, say, the director level person who can do anything in a, in a hierarchy. And then you have their, their, their sort of underlings. And we'll look at that a little bit. This idea of permission inheritance is a big deal, too. Um, extensible workflow states, uh, we'll get to that a little bit. Um, single repository for media management. Uh, media management is a huge problem in Drupal and most other CMSs. Um, we'll talk about that, too. And then this, this is great. Um, can I modify and publish content without it going live immediately? Um, what I should say, I'm jumping around a little bit, and I apologize. We build a lot of websites. Uh, we do a lot of projects, and one of the problems that we have in the Drupal world is that clients very frequently, and we were just talking about this in the hallway, right? Uh, hey, budget crunch hit. Drupal looks a lot more attractive than that half a million dollar licensing fee for the software we have been using. I've done projects that had six-figure six figure, six figure web production budgets that were still smaller than the yearly licensing fee than, of proprietary software that we were replacing. Um, this is a big deal. The problem that comes in when you do these kind of projects, and how many of you have done those kind of transitional projects, which are oh so much fun. One of the problems, even if you're not dealing with those kind of transitional projects, even if you're just dealing with people who are used to editing Word documents, right, is that uh, your non-technical users, and your, even your technical users, but your non-technical users in particular, bring a ton, an absolute ton of uns unknown to them and unstated to you expectations about what content management actually means, right? We deal with a lot of folks um, who are coming out of these systems that were built in the late 90s, early 2000s that publish flat files, right? Um, and so they work in a database to edit their files and when they're finally ready for it to go to the website, they push a button and it spits out a flat file. Right? And that flat file never gets updated so they can do 18 revisions of the, ver of the, si of the, the page but it never goes live, right? In, in a Drupal, you know, or even WordPress model, that doesn't exist, right? You make a change and whoop, it goes, right? And there's, this, there's no concept of, natively, being able to say, well, I published this page, but now I want to make some changes, but my boss has to approve them before I can actually hit the publish button, right? The big problem that we run into when we're dealing with, with our clients, actually, is that these are unstated expectations that don't come up until after we've delivered the project and the budget's dead, right? It's like, hey, we're in pre-release beta, and they try to do their job the way they see it, and they go, wait a minute, why can't I do this? And then we go, well, you never said, <laughs> you know, I need to be able to do this, or I expect to be able to do this, right? So. When I talk about these common challenges, these are all things that come up, uh, not for one client or for, you know, one weird case, but um, many clients over and over again, recurring pain points. And I'll, I'll show you a list here in a second. So this is one of those common things that we get is, hey, I want to map my content to editorial teams and the editorial teams might not have anything to do with the site information architecture, because information architecture maps to public views of your, your content, 
whereas some of the, the back-end editing responsibilities have everything to do with org charts and uh, blame and things like that. So we might have, and we'll look at our sample, uh, when we talk about Workbench Access, we'll talk about our sample, which is a museum website. And the museum website is split into three different groups, right, for the public. There's a museum, there's a library, and there's a gift shop, right? Three different editorial sections to things, right? And you might have people who are in charge of just moderating and curating the, the museum exhibits on the web, right? And you might have people who are in charge of moderating and and curating the library content, there might be a subset of that library content that's only in, of interest to the staff. And so one person might be in charge of this, where their boss is in charge of this whole thing. Does this make any sense? When I want to sort of, okay, complex, sort of multi-level editing controls that might jump responsibilities because of budget cuts, right? The, the secretary in the gift shop who's responsible for this stuff might also be the secretary over here, right? Or you might have interns and things like that um, who are responsible for a variety of things. We want to be able to map that in an efficient model. So I have the same slide twice. We, we just talked about this. So this is another map of that same thing, right? These are individual users. And this is the way, if you actually got the client to explain it, this is what they might say. Well, you know... <laughs> Kelly is one of our editors and she's in charge of just, you know, these three things. Well, that's odd for her to be in charge of. Um, but trying to map out these kind of business rules can be really, really challenging. Um, and then supporting these business rules, that's the other big thing that we want to get into. So, wow, what am I doing? I don't know why that went in. Um, so Barnard is a good example. Barnard University, uh, Barnard College, I should say. Barnard College is a women's college associated with um, Columbia University. It's one of the historical um, sister schools of the Ivy League. Um, still predominantly women, I think. I think it's, anyway, um, is actually one of the most um, selective and influential private schools in the entire uh, country. Uh, I, I don't have this part memorized, but I'm supposed to. Um, graduates include Jean Kirkpatrick, former, sec um, for former um, ambassador to the United Nations. Uh, what's her name? Martha Stewart. And there's a, there's a third big name I'm supposed to remember, and I can't. Uh, but this is one of those cases where we're coming in and replacing a legacy system. Um, they have the electronic communications department who's actually in charge of running the website. Then they have an IT department that's in charge of making sure the website runs, which are two separate tasks, right? So the, the electronic communications part department are in charge of content, and the IT department, of course, is in charge of servers. Um, they have 50 academic departments and programs. They have, uh, in the model that I just showed, they have 30 different site sections, um, and they have 200 separate editors, right? Um, in the Barnard web model, they have, uh, they're split across 50 different uh, domain access installations, actually. There are 50 concurrent um, .barnard.edu sites running under one installation. And then there's access controls to each of those individual parts. And we'll, we'll look at that here in a second. Um, this is another one of our clients. <laughs> this slide. Uh, this is the Field Museum. Uh, yeah, yeah, this is the uh, opening night party at DrupalCon Chicago from the Field Museum. Um, it was a lot of fun. You should have been there. Um, so Field Museum has hundreds of scientists and researchers spread across dozens of departments. Um, they have massive amount of content and digital assets. I mean, thousands and thousands. Um, they have a database, it's the EMU database, that has a... EMU captures data about everything in their collection, and the stated mission of the Field Museum is to collect one or more copies of every living thing on the entire planet. Um, EMU is a gigantic denormalized database that has millions and millions of records in it. Um, they, however, had a web staff, I think, when we started, of three people. Right? So they had three people trying to keep up with hundreds of people, and they certainly couldn't. Um, there's this massive bottleneck of content waiting to be approved or waiting to be translated from, you know, one medium to the web medium, um, and they needed tools to make that more efficient. So, hey, look, it's a brain, nice, bright, shiny website. Um, 
I love the T-Rex stuff. Sue the T-Rex. You can follow Sue the T-Rex on Twitter, by the way. So Workbench, and, and here's what I want to say. Um, when we started Drupal 7, um, I mean, the Drupal 7 development process was a lot of, it was very exciting as uh, part of it. Um, we have a lot of core contributors at Palantir, but when we were at DrupalCon San Francisco, we actually sat down over pizza one night and we wrote down a list of all of the headaches that our clients caused us. Now, I say our clients caused us. Really, they're the headaches that Drupal caused us because our clients had actual expectations of functionality. Um, so the, when we talk about Workbench, Workbench is a set of editorial tools, an extensible set of editorial tools that are designed to make running your day-to-day -day website easier for the people who are really just responsible for making sure that the content is accurate, right? We actually do, one of our, one of our um, smarter people says, Workbench in many cases hides Drupal from people, right? It's designed to be this centralized dashboard. Uh, at the same time, under the hood, um, what we're doing is, I mean, this is the actual first feature list that we came up with. We sat down and we wrote down everything that people wanted, had asked us for in Drupal 6 that we had to cobble together. And we, we listed off, well, what modules did we use to make that happen? How did we make that happen? And the answer is there's like 25 things in the right-hand column, right? The problem that we kept running into was those, of those 25 things, um, three of them might not work with the other 22. Right? Well, number one, you don't want to install 25 modules to just to do some basic stuff. Right? Um, the bigger problem we ran into was that um, one module might call something a revision and another module might call something an edit. Uh, one module might call something um, published and another, another might call it approved. Um, there, were, there are workflow and um, language disconnects all throughout uh, Drupal contributed module space, right? I mean, are you familiar with this problem? This problem that you have to teach people like six different ideas just to get them to do one task, right? So this was sort of our hit list of how can we make things a little simpler, right? Um, and it was a lot of fun, actually. <laughs> fun in a very strange, strange way. So at the basics, there are three levels to what Workbench is about when we talk about it. Um, access control, file management, and, content, and uh, really revision moderation, right? These are at the core of what we're trying to do. And we want to provide a unified, sort of seamless interface for making all this happen. Okay? So, all right, okay. That's the backstory, right? So, okay. The rest of the, the wow, 45 minutes. And we're going to get out early because it's late, you know? I hate being the last guy, but we're gonna, we'll get out early if you want to. Um, so let's take a look. This is a test install. Uh, there's a little bit of dummy content. For those of you familiar with DVEL and DVEL Generate, there's a lot of DVEL content in here. Um, I'm going to log in as the librarian, and we're going to take a look. This is Drupal 7, by the way. This is native Drupal 7. So the librarian here is pretty limited role. Uh, librarian is an editor. Um, and the, the hierarchy structure that we have here is one that I showed in the slide before. There's a, a museum. This is our fictional museum. And there are three big sections to the site, right? There's, there's the, the museum collection, there's the library section, and then there's the, the gift shop. The librarian, pretty obviously, is in charge of library stuff. Right. So the first thing that you'll notice, of course, is we have a big fat My Workbench icon right up here. How many of you guys have used Drupal 7? I asked this before. But, okay. um, so boom. All right, what do we have here? Um, a very quick, yeah, that's my grumpy Viking photo. That's the, my wife wanted me to take photos in a photo booth. Oh, this is another South Carolina thing. We were in Aiken, uh, and uh, there was little, you know, what do you, what do you, costumes, there were costumes to wear. So I got a little, and she didn't think I was having any fun. And so I said, fine, I'll make, I'm, you know, so I made the grumpiest face I could. <sighs> anyway, um, so this is just a content dashboard for that user. Uh, this is actually an extensible page. There's a hook 
for the module developers out there, you can add things to or remove to remove things from. This all this really does is give you three views, um, and the three default views are uh, information about you, uh, the quick list of things that you've been working on recently, and the quick list of things that everyone's been working on. Um, and one thing you'll notice in particular here, um, we have this section bit, and this has to do with access control. Right. I'm the librarian. I'm in charge of everything that has to do with the library. And what this column is showing me is, oh, well, the employee manual is part of the library staff section, which is a subset of library, therefore falls under your control. Right. So this is a quick snapshot of everything that I might care about. Right. And it's divorced in some respect from the site information architecture, right? Views lets us do this, right? Let's us go and pull it out of context and prepare it actually in a better context for that user. So the user only has to look at what they care about, right? This list in particular is, hey, here are things that are, you know, two of them you'll notice are not published. They're not live yet. Uh, that's because they're under moderation. They have to be approved by someone else before they can go live. And we'll talk about that here in a second. Um, but the idea is, hey, just show me what I have to do, right? If you know you want to go in and make an edit to a page, or you know you want to go in and create new content, that's, again, what we're trying to do. Um, tabs across the top, again, a quick tour, uh, create content. This is actually the same uh, create you know, content page that Drupal core ships with, except it's um, extensible. <laughs> uh, we've already added in the, the create media bit from media module. It's part of the Workbench Media Integration uh, piece. Uh, so you can add other things here uh, that are not necessarily nodes. There's a patch in, uh, there was usability testing done at the University of Minnesota recently, and they found that when they gave people the, con the, the task, uh, go create a, a block in the, in the right sidebar, everyone went to the Create Content button, and then they couldn't find how to create a block because it's not there. So we have a patch to add create block to this list, um, but I'm getting pushback on it. But we'll see. Everyone else is, you know, they're giving the, the Minnesota presentation at Drupal Camp Colorado right now, so they'll all get. Where did you say that patch was followed? Uh, it's, it's a workbench patch. It's not a core patch. Um, there will be stuff spinning out of that for core. I know there will be. Um, and I think the there's a, there's going to be an issue tag for it, but I can't remember what it is. Um, it might be like MNUX 2011 or something like that. Um, I'd have to go look. They're, they're going to make some noise about it, I know. Um, so again, nice and easy stuff. There's also here uh, a file tab that, oh my goodness, shows a list of every file that was uploaded to the site. Um, and I didn't actually know that it, it showed me user pictures, too. That's kind of handy. Um, and it'll even tell me, and these were all just auto-generated, uh, but it'll even tell me what node the picture is attached to, right? so I can find things. Um, this is pretty crude at the moment, but we'll get more advanced, uh, particularly as the media module progresses. Um, but that makes me pretty happy. And <laughs> it is too wide for my screen. Um, the other thing, uh, there is a My Sections tab. There's some debate about what that is. This just shows the list of things that I'm assigned to from an editorial standpoint. And here it's just showing me that I'm, I'm at library. Uh, but if I am, I am in my, con uh, yeah, back in my content, we can look at content I've edited, which by default shows you, this is interesting again from a workflow management standpoint. By default, this page shows you everything that you have edited that has not been approved for publication. Well, why, was, why is this useful, right? Because it shows you all your unfinished work. You know, think about it. You're like, hey, I'm an editor. I want to come in and I want to get something done today. Oh, here are the two things that I've got that are unfinished. Why are they unfinished, right? And you can go in and figure that out. Um, so that's really, really nice. Um, you'll notice here, um, this is, again, and, and I'll show you the admin bit in a second. From a section perspective, I'm in charge of library. And that's all I've been assigned to. But when we talk about hierarchical oops, access, you'll notice that the sections filter here in the view actually shows everything underneath library in the hierarchy. Right? Um, 
when we talk about workbench access, the difference between it and something like organic groups or oddly enough even taxonomy access is that taxonomy access uses a one-to-one -one data storage model, which means if you wanted someone to be in charge of these three sections, you'd have to store all three records in the database. Uh, workbench access doesn't do that. It uses an API to say, well, if I'm in charge of library, automatically make me in charge of the, everything underneath it. Right. Does that make sense? No, it's, it's, it's easier to explain to people because you, and there's less boxes to check, which makes a lot of things a lot easier. Um, look at the sort of moderation stuff. And this actually, if you download the module right now, you'll, beta 5 is the one that's out. This feature is not in beta 5. Mm. This is, we're, we're getting ready to do another, uh, it's going to be beta 6. Um, this is designed to be a very, very simple snapshot of information about what you're looking at. Because when you start getting into, from a Drupal perspective, um, hey, this is a revision that might be live or it might need approval, and it, you know, it's in the library section and you can edit it, but it, or it's in the, in the gift shop ex section so you can't edit it, you know, people can get confused very, very easily. So what we wanted is a very simple way to drop information to clue the user in of what they were looking at and why. All right, this is actually a block you can drop anywhere. So if you don't like it here in the user interface, you can put it over here. You can put it at the bottom of the page. I don't care, right? But it tells us, oh, this is in the library staff section. Oh, this is a draft. It's not published. Um, this is the most current revision. And oh, by the way, there's a little moderate form right here, and let's see if this works the way I expect it to. Yeah, this person has no permission to get things out of the needs review state. Can't do it. I, this person, the librarian, cannot move this content to live, right? If I go back, actually, well, let's go to that same node as the admin user. Ah, well, I can publish that. I'll go back here, refresh this. Ah. Now I'm looking at a published, the published version of this node, right? Because someone else has taken it out of moderation, and now it's live, right? Um, and what's interesting, again, from a u u user experience perspective, we've actually changed the names of the tabs across the top, which are normally view and edit. Right. We're trying to give a little more contextual data here, as you can see in the back. You know, view published, which means view the live version. New draft, which means, hey, I'm going to create a new draft, <laughs> right? as opposed to edit. Um, it still could use a little bit of work. Um, and then for those of you who are familiar with uh, any of the, what, six moderation modules that were in Drupal, in Drupal 6, um, pretty straightforward moderation tab. Um, there's nothing in this one, but if I go in, this is, again, very, very interesting. Um, live demo typos, yay. Um, by the way, yeah, it's telling me you're still in the library staff section. Um, this is going to be a new draft of live content. Well, what does that mean? Well, hopefully it, what, what do you think that means, by the way? It's a copy. Yeah, it's interesting. The, some of the user experience testing from Drupal 6 that got into Drupal 7 basically said, wow, you put too much text in your interfaces and it confuses the crap out of people. So we've tried real hard to strip out extraneous messages and give you contextual messages that actually give you the information that you need, right? So the theory is, yeah, I mean, conceptually, how difficult is that as a training task, right? To explain what that little message means or what that little tab means in terms of moderating of your content or the difference between the live state and the published state. It, it's interesting, one of the things that we noticed, um, we actually install Workbench on every single site we build, actually from now on, forever. Um, but we don't necessarily turn on all the modules because we don't, some of them don't need, some of our clients don't need the complex workflow stuff, 
right? So I just did a site that only has core workbench. They're not using the access control. They're not using the moderation. They're just using the, the user dashboard stuff. And it turned a two hour training session into a 20 minute training session. <laughs> Because instead of having to guide them through menus and this and that and explain all kinds of things they don't care about, it was just click this, oh look. All right. So this kind of thing um, it gets us really, really excited. Um, so if I go in and save this, uh -huh. now, and I didn't actually write this module, so I'm, I was impressed, I didn't realize it was gonna do this. It actually takes me to the draft that I just did. Hey. This is a draft, it's not published, it is the current one, and I'm on the view draft tab, right? Do you want to view the published one, right? That's nice and clear, right? So, hooray. And if I go back as the admin to this node, yeah, it, I can see the view draft. And if I, pull, if I fire up a third browser, by the way, let's just double check it. Let's make sure it works the way we expect. Fire up a third browser. Yeah, employee manual. Yeah, um, they wouldn't normally see the view publish tab, but I have DVL turned on on this site for the, ad, the anonymous user, so that's why. Um, again, as an anonymous user, it's seamless. Does that make sense? Okay. And that's what we're after. So, you wanna see the back end stuff? I mean, this is basically the, the editorial workflow for, for users. This is a pretty basic user. Um, if we go into the moderate tab right now, they can see this stuff. Um, they do have the ability to revert back to the old live state, which is interesting. And I don't actually know the, the full extent to how that's being controlled. I assume anything that was ever a published revision can be reverted by someone who has the permission. That's my assumption, but I haven't tested it. Um, and here still, I can't get this out of state. It's still in this review state, which is great. Are there questions so far? Am I jumping around too much or going too fast? Is it, does it look useful? <laughs> yeah. Um, one of the things that I, that I wanna say about it actually before we get into the, the sort of back end stuff, uh, it goes back to that whole sales pitch thing. Um, we're not building a distribution, right? It's not um, Open Atrium, it's not Open Scholar, it's not any of the Drupal distributions. It's a series of modules that have APIs that we're hoping people will use. And the thing that's got us excited so far is that some of the folks on the, the uh, user experience team are excited about testing out some ideas for Drupal 8 in Workbench. So we've got some Decent usability reviews so far, which is fun. So I'll give you an example of one of the things we're gonna do. We're moving the delete button. We're moving it into a tab. Because there's no way you should have a delete node button on the node itself. Edit's a tab, why the heck is delete a button? That's just a bad idea. Um, so, okay. Let's start with access because I wrote the access stuff. and That's the part I'm most excited about. So Workbench Access is, is a slightly different approach. And if you were at, were you at Self last year when I talked about Node Access? Um, it's not a traditional Node Access module. It's one of these sexy D7 Node Access modules um, that uses hook Node Access to assert um, grants over individual nodes at the time you view them. So it has no effect on node listings, which is actually pretty important if you're doing site architecture, right? So it's not going to, for example, segregate things so that people who are, are looking at the library website only see library content. It doesn't do that. But when you look at a single node that belongs to the library section, then it intercedes and says, well, what's going on here? Um, can they view it? Can they edit it? Can they delete it, right? So it's not a node access module. It's what I call a content access module. And if you haven't read um, Drupal 7 module development, go, go buy a copy. I'll get a little check and it'll be nice. There's a whole chapter on how this stuff works. So uh, Workbench Access is, like I said, an API and it's designed to, to be lazy or, or for you or for developers, it's designed to be lazy. Um, rather than write a hierarchy management system from scratch, what I decided to do um, 
Because actually in Drupal 6, we already had taxonomy access control, which actually isn't truly hierarchical. Um, and I had written a module called menu node edit, which should have been called menu access, but someone stole the namespace on me. Um, two days before I was going to release, they stole the namespace on me. <sighs> Sigh. Um, so all I do is I provide plugins for other systems that create hierarchies already. Um, the two that are currently supported are menu and taxonomy. Right. So I just piggyback on, you know, all that drag and drop taxonomy, you know, hierarchy creation stuff that Drupal already does. I just graft onto it and say, okay, for your hierarchy, describe it to Workbench access in the way that I can understand it so I could use it to administer my permissions. Right. You can actually hear from the, this is the settings screen, which you will probably never use, which is kind of fun. Um, you can switch between menu and taxonomy. I don't recommend you do it in production, but you can. Um, you can have more than one vocabulary active at a time, which is kind of interesting. Uh, if you need to, um, two things down here, these are kind of interesting. Um, this automated section assignment, we'll, we'll talk about in a second, um, has to do with, if this is checked, which it, and it's checked by default now, uh, everything in your hierarchy becomes an editorial section. If you uncheck it, then you can turn certain things off. And we'll look in a second and figure out why that might be interesting. Um, and then this is just a little thing we put in for the UX people um, so that you can name it whatever you want to when we're talking about it in the user interface. Um, for our early clients like Barnard, it says workbench access all over the place. And they said, no, we want to call it sections or we want to call it, I don't know. Those are the only two words I have for it. Well, we just made it configurable. So the other parts to this interface are the sections overview. And now I have automated um, section assignments running. So that means everything that's in my um, vocabulary is automatically a section. And it might make sense if I went real quick. This is my active, this is my, when I say we're piggybacking on other systems, this is the, the taxonomy for the museum, right? And Workbench Access will actually create this for you as a demo if you ask it to, um, which is kind of helpful. Um, so if we went in and said, oh, let's add a new term and we'll call it Linux because we're doing Linuxy things. Well, the rest of the week we're doing Linuxy things. Um, and I'll save that. And I'll go back to the list, and where'd it go? And Linux will be its own thing. Sure, what the heck. And now, cross my fingers, we'll go back to sections. There it is. And Linux is automatically now assigned as an editorial section, right? Which is kind of cool. If I actually turn off um, the auto assignment, well, hey, let me turn off the auto assignment. I'll just do that. Uh, turn that off. Save that. Now, now that I've got it turned off, if I go here, this is my Linux section, it'll ask me if you want it to be an editorial section or not. Well, that's kind of nice. Now, why would you do that? That is the, the question. Now, part of the point to, to piggybacking on existing hierarchy systems is so that we don't have to retrain our users to learn other form elements. Currently, we do. Currently, Workbench Access, because Field API makes things a little more complicated, currently, Workbench Access actually makes its own access control form element on the node editing form. We saw it very briefly. Um, in the next rev, once I get time to write the patch, we're going to piggyback on native node forms, which means if you taught someone how to use taxonomy tagging for your site, they can automatically use access control. Or if you taught somebody how to put things in the menu system, they can automatically use access control. Right. Um, so in the future, uh, imagine that this is your actual site information architecture. Right. Well, you may decide that this kind of granular control really matters for the exhibits and the library, but the gift shop, it, who cares? Right. It's minor. So you can just disable these two things to remove them from user interfaces to, to prevent confusion. Right. Because less options are easier to deal with. Right? But the only person who ever has to make that decision or deal with it is the person administering these permissions. Does that make sense? Uh, so it's probably a feature that you'll never use, but it's nice to have because it's there. Uh, or it's there because it's nice to have. Yeah. The, the irony is actually this is the way I originally architected it. 
And then our usability guys were like, why would I want to turn anything off? So I said, fine, I'll, I'll enable them all by default. But if you wanted the advanced you know, feature, you certainly could. Um, okay, so the other two things that you can do, um, and this is fun, is there are two, two different screens for assigning permissions right now. And these are pretty basic, uh, but they work. And I like that they work. Uh, we were looking at library, oh, let's do Linux. Oh, what the heck. Um, you can assign new editors um, by individual users. Oops. So I have a, a user with the fascinating name of contributor. Um, right. We just added the contributor is now an editor to this section. Right. But you can also do editors by entire roles, which as a site administrator makes your job much, much easier. Right? Because you just go in and say, oh, fine. Anyone who's an editor can edit this thing. Right? I know it'll tell you who they are and why they can, why are they here, right? essentially. Uh, and that's really nice. Um, very exciting. You can even, if you are crazy, because somebody asked me about this, what if you want anonymous users to create content? Someone's already doing this, and, and I, I, love, I love it when people ask questions and the answer is, oh, just do this and this. He said, we're, so we're running a website, we're the Southeast Linux Festival website, and we got people doing videos, right? But we have a job board, and we want anonymous users to be able to post unpublished content to the job board that is then approved and goes live. Workbench actually makes that really, really easy to do. Um, in fact, that would be a great demo site. Anyway. Um, there's actually a permission in here called do, do, do. allow all members of this role to be assigned to workbench access sections. All right, you want to assign anonymous users because here's the way it works. Once, once we declare that there's an access control scheme in place, um, I start asserting rules, which means if you try to create content and you're not assigned to a section, you're locked out. Right, which is by design. Right? Now imagine, and I can see this coming, it's coming, imagine I get to map that instead of to an internal hierarchy like uh, Drupal editorial, uh, Drupal uh, taxonomies. What about if I map that to LDAP groups? It's not actually that hard. It's just a matter of translating it through the API. It'd be a question of, hey, can I query for these LDAP groups? And I assume LDAP has hierarchies. It must, right? Anyone know? Um, yeah. So if I can query LDAP and get the hierarchy structure, I can translate that into a, a language that um, Workbench Access understands. And then instead of going in and saying, well, you know, assign it to a taxonomy, you just go in and say, no, no, assign it to the proper LDAP group or whatever you end up calling it. Or even better, we write a small module and just do it automatically. Oh, look, John is editing content and John is in the biology department LDAP group. All his content's going in that department. Done, right? Uh, and as a developer, if I've done things correctly, that shouldn't take you more than a day and a half. Should, shouldn't. It might, but it, it shouldn't. So that's kind of cool. Are there questions about this sort of permission stuff? And again, what's Interesting, uh, let's look at my librarian again here. Oh, the librarian, I just added the librarian to Linux, so that's good. So if I go in as the librarian and I want to create content again, I'm going to create an article. And it says, okay, you're part of the library group. Where do you want it to go? And you're part of the Linux group too. Boom. Nice. And we could do it silently if we chose to. That would be evil. Just auto-assign that stuff, but we don't right now. Um, the next thing that's coming, by the way, there's a patch that um, was not of high priority to us, but other people might like it. The next thing that's coming is the ability to assign this to more than one editorial group at a time, right? which is part of supporting the native. You'll notice this actually doesn't use the native um, taxonomy form. Um, because again, field API makes it complicated, but before I can do that, I have to be able to support multiple section assignments. And sometimes we're on budgets that other people determine, so that features, there's a patch. It's sitting in the queue waiting for people to review it. Um, 
So that's, again, uh, workbench access. Again, you set up your sections. You can set them up however you want. You assign users or roles to them. Um, one of the interesting things to note, by the way, so by role, let's see. By role, the librarian is a member of the Linux group. Um, if I were to, let me go, hold on. I can, I can use my own interface. Because of the way things are architected, if you say the librarian is a member by account, and then you take the role away, and that person is a contributor, it does not, oh, I messed it up again. Darn it. Revoking the role permission does not revoke the user permission. And that's by design, right? User, you know, what's the rule? The rule would be specific permissions override general permissions. And that's very Linuxy, isn't it? Yay! I did something right in Linux world. Yay! Okay, so it's <laughs> um, a good moderation, real fast. The, the moderation stuff. Have anyone ever? Somebody mentioned this earlier when we were talking in the in the hallway. Has anyone dealt with moderation in Drupal? Six in particular, it's a real ugly beast. Um, there are probably three good modules that are 80% finished um, that don't play nicely together. Um, we were again uh, on time and on budget. We ended up doing a fork of the content moderation module from Drupal 6, um, largely because the developer wasn't interested in working on Drupal 7 at the time, So, and it, its code was the cleanest, I believe. I, I wasn't actually involved in the decision. So we took it over. Well, we didn't take it over, we just forked it. We, we forked it and it's now its own thing. Um, and I should also point out that um, all of these modules, Workbench Moderation, Workbench Access, Workbench Files, Workbench Media, and Workbench itself are all released separately. They're not a one big bundle. Um, and while you get the dashboard by installing the Workbench module, you can run Workbench Moderation and Workbench Access by themselves. Um, I wouldn't. I would always download the, the primary Workbench module, but you can, uh, which is kind of interesting. So Workbench moderation gives you, yes, extensible workflow states, right? Um, one of the limitations to this, of course, is that these are linear workflow states, but they are very, very flexible, and they're very flexible in large part because every state you define creates its own permission. Right, and the permission, oh, excuse me, I've got that wrong. That's not true. There's another stage. There are states, and then there are transitions. Right. Excuse me. And every transition has its own permission, right? So my librarian can actually move things from draft to needs review, but that's it, right? Um, or can move things from needs review to draft. You could have a, a state, let's make one, sure, what the heck. We'll make a state that says, no, no, you can move from draft to published because we want you to break things. All right, moderate, moderate from draft to published, and that was a contributor, sure, what the heck. All right. So now when I go back here to view this draft, oh, look, I can make it go live right now. All right. This is, again, for those of you who don't use Drupal much, I mean, this is the kind of thing that gets a lot of people really excited about Drupal. Hey, look, I made one really, really simple change through a user interface and enabled this whole new set of features for people. All right. So um, the moderation stuff is really, really powerful because of that. So yeah, you can have different workflow states, which is great. Um, and then uh, Rebecca White, who's the developer on this, also um, created this little tool that um, will get more advanced. Um, this stuff gets very conceptually difficult to keep straight. So she built a little permission checker to make sure that you've configured things correctly so that people can do what you expect them to do, um, which I think is kind of cool. Um, so the question is, yeah, can the contributor um, 
Yeah. Publish, moderate content of the article type. No. And so it actually gives you a message. Here's things that fail the permission check. Um, but this kind of flexibility is really, really exciting. Um, now, the other thing that I noted uh, is that this is stuff that came out of a, a sort of group conversation that we had uh, at, leading up to DrupalCon San Francisco. Um, you'll notice this is a very linear flow, right? You just move, you can move things from state to state. Um, and that's an interesting editorial model, but it's not the only editorial model. And this is where I got excited. Uh, we got a, a, a new guy in our office, um, Steve Persh, and on his first day, we had a workbench um, developers meeting, and we were whiteboarding stuff, and we were talking about this, and Steve came up with the following module that is yet to be written, but needs to be written. It's the workbench approval model module. And what does the workbench approval model do? Module do. Um, it creates an approval tab on every node that sets up asynchronous nonlinear approvals before content can go live. What the hell does that mean? That means let's say that you work for a gigantic university, right? And you have an HR department and you have a legal department and you have a technical expert for everything that has to get reviewed that goes live on your website. So it's got to be checked for political correct language by the HR department. It's got to be correct for legal liabilities by the legal department. And some tech expert has to actually read it. Oh, and then an editor has to approve its grammar. So you got four people. Well, we could run it through workflow states, but that will get complicated real quick. So Steve's idea was, no, I just want a tab that I can go to that says, well, you're, you're authorized to be a legal reviewer of this content. No legal reviewer has approved it yet. Do you approve? Yes. And then we can build views off that sort of thing, right? So when you go into your workbench dashboard as the, the lawyer, hey, what's, what new content is waiting for me that needs legal approval? Boom. Yeah. We, you, you mean like you want an email? Yeah. Um, I don't think so because that requires actions integration, yes? Oh, excuse me, the question was, <laughs> yeah, this is like the most helpful room guy I've ever had. We've never had that, I've never, I've done a lot of these and we've never had the question symbol. Anyway, the question was, I want to get email notifications or, or some, some Right? I don't want to just log in every day and look. I want to get a notification if something occurs that I need to respond to. Um, and the answer to that is uh, triggers and actions will allow for that. And I don't believe we have integration for that yet, but it's fairly trivial. Sure. Right. So the the question was essentially, there's an approval. Right. And that's okay, so. Yeah, a non-hierarchical approval process by which, for something to go live, a single person in the same in in a category has to be able to approve it. And I think that goes to the workbench approval module that we were just sort of describing. That and when I described it, I said, you know, there's a legal reviewer and there's a you know a technical reviewer and there's a grammar reviewer. Well, you might just have one bucket a peer reviewer. A peer must sign off on this. That is not you. That's fine. That, and that shouldn't be very hard to implement. Um, it shouldn't be hard at all, really. Because what you would end up doing, right, is the, the only trick to that workflow model really is um, I suppose when the last person approves it, they'll get a would you like to publish this button. <laughs> It, it would essentially be, you know, you'd go to, the, to the, the approval page and be like, yes, no one in this bucket has approved it yet. People in these other buckets have. And actually, if you've ever submitted content to the Drupal Watchdog magazine, they have something similar to this, um, although it's not automated. But they have, they, they do reviews of your content according to these sort of categories. Be like, oh, no one, no one has reviewed this for grammar yet. Um, but... What's interesting, and, and the reason I, I sort of ask what people are interested in and 
Uh, we're doing this talk again at DrupalCon London, and I think in London we're going to start trying to recruit more user experience folks because the, question, the answer to the question you're asking is not a technical answer. It's a, what's the best way to present that to you, right? And, and so I keep finding myself in issue queues going and saying, like, can you sketch it on a napkin or can you, can you explain to me the workflow you really, really want? And so one is, and this is a, a really cool one, would be, hey, something new or something changed that I'm in charge of. I want to get an email and then I want to be able to approve it immediately. Yeah. And that's the sort of thing we need. And the, yeah, what do the interfaces look like? One of the big challenges that's coming up in the access control world for this is right now, uh, all those hierarchical permissions, it doesn't matter what type of node you're looking at, it, it just doesn't matter, I don't care. Um, not because I can't do it, but because the user interface for trying to assign those fine-grained permissions is really, really complicated. Because you can imagine a, a world, and I, I know people who are gonna want this because I've already talked to them, where you have the, um, well, we're back to the Southeast Linux Festival website, right? And we have the jobs board, and we have the video page, and we have the conference schedule bit, right? And we have a user, and we'll call this user Jane, and Jane should be able to publish job notices in the job section, and that's a content type. And Jane should be able to edit all other content types in the video section but not publish new content in the video section. You can actually right now implement one hook in your own custom code and override that behavior very, very easily. There's just no user interface for it because trying to come up with the proper user interface for, I want to have granular permissions per content type per section is a freaking nightmare. Right? And one of the places where Drupal traditionally falls down, and, and I had a very honest conversation with a potential client on Friday. I said, Drupal user interfaces are guilty of the following thing. They are great until you get more than about 20 things in them. Let's do the blocks page is a good example, or, the, or this page. Can you imagine what this page would look like if we had 20 moderation states? Right. So I don't know, and I, I literally would say, I don't know, let me find my cursor. Um, I don't know how to build This page, I think I know how to build it because at this point I've, I'm only looking at museum, right? Um, but what is it here? Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about another limitation that Drupal has um, in my head, in my twisted head. Um, Drupal core has you know, the crud hooks. There are four states for any piece or four actions you can perform on any piece of content. View, or create, view, edit, and delete. That's not enough. I also think there's a preview, which means I want to be able to view the unpublished version. Um, there's a revise, and I can't remember what my third one was. But they're actually hard, let me look. They're hard coded in, in the module. Uh, I forgot what it was. And I need to submit a patch for this for Drupal 8. Because the problem is in Drupal core, these things are hard-coded. Publish, yeah. I think publish should actually be a permission. <laughs> I mean, think about it. So, yeah, in, in Drupal core, only these four things get run through node access, and there's actually a whitelist, right? You can't run any other operation through node access. It just doesn't work. Um, and one of my challenges for Drupal 8 is to figure out how many of these things to get into core and or how to make core's access model extensible. Because right now, again, there's a whitelist. Even better, it's a statically cached whitelist of results, which makes things really, really complicated. But when you look at, we actually look at the way people behave, and like I said, those sort of unspoken expectations of what content management actually means, no, there are kind of these seven different things, right? Well, I mean, people will go, well, what's the difference between update and revise, right? Well, update means, I want to create a new copy of things. Revise means I want to sh switch from version to version of the published content. I mean, that, that's what it means to me. Um, you know, what's the difference, what, what's preview for? There's a preview button, doesn't it? 
No. Preview means you have the permission to view something that no one else can view. All right? And it's weird because we sort of have that permission in Drupal core, but we don't really have that permission in Drupal core. Um, you can look in the node, ac node access function and find out. And yeah, the idea that we have a delete button but not a publish button is a user experience nightmare. All right. So we have like three minutes left. Are there any other questions or should we just go and enjoy the rest of the day? Um, we're using CK Editor on everything, and it has a paste from Word. Oh, excuse me. The question was, have you found a WYSIWYG editor that protects against the, and I'm going to editorialize, protects against the demonic crap that paste from Word forces onto web applications? Um, CK, most of the modern WYSIWYG libraries handle that decently well. The problem is there's a paste from Word button that performs cleanup when it translates what the user inputs before it shoves it into Drupal. And you have to train people to use it. Um, yeah, that's, again, part of the whole workbench process for us, again, as people who develop and maintain sites for people, is standardization of what we're doing, right? And so it's similar to an install profile. Everyone gets CK editor, right? Everyone gets workbench. Whether or not they get moderation or, or access is a different thing. But it also leads to some really fun conversations, right? I'm, I was doing training for a client, and um, I was showing them Workbench. I know we got two minutes left. Uh, we were showing them Workbench, and they were excited, and we started to go through publishing workflows, and someone in the training session went, well, how do I make a change without editing what's live? And I said, well, you know, we didn't install that feature for you because we don't, you don't need it unless you really, really need it. So we should talk about that. But it'll take about 10 minutes to get you up and running with that. They're doing it now. They like turned it on behind my back and they started running it. You know, they're revising everything. Um, and having that kind of power is really, really, really helpful. I'll take one more question if there is one more question. Yeah. Right, so there's two questions here. One is about the ownership of content pages, right? There's someone who, who owns or is ultimately responsible for that page. And the other is about the scheduled revision of those pages and sort of notifying the owner, hey, this thing is potentially out of date, right? Um, it's interesting, again, uh, these are things that we've had to deal with before. I built a website in Drupal 6 that was very, very painful that had the following concept. Um, it used, this, used that section thing for, for editorial control, but then every page could also have an owner, and the page owner might not even be able to edit it, but got notified every time it was changed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And typically that was a department head who had underlings actually doing things. Um, I think that's important. That's actually pretty easy to do. It's, again, just a sort of a user interface question. And, and the second part to that question was the hey, it's getting stale, it's been six months. Um, does anyone actually know if there's a module for that yet? Because there should be. I don't think there is. I mean, there's the scheduler module which says, I want this thing to go live on July 4th and come down on July 7th. But there's nothing that says, I want this person to be notified six months from now. Although we've already gotten that feature request. Now, the way we handle this in the workbench world is everything we've built is modular and uses views and so it should be very, very easy to just sort of insert that into what's already there, right? So that you then can, can have a view that says, you know, show me everything that's getting stale, right? Um, so, yeah, that's good. You're going to throw that in the issue queue. That's a good one. Um, that'll probably get spun off into its, its own module. Again, it's one of those things that I'm shocked doesn't exist. But anyway, uh, I want to thank you for your time and your attention. It is uh, 5 o'clock, which means it's time to go. Thank you.
like it. We have the same problem. What would happen if you did this? Like you gave me a I found a problem. How do you do that? It's like this. Well, I disagree. Who would have thought of that? Let's put the word out. WebOS, an OS that works the way that you do. Across all your devices, HP Slate and WebOS, HP. As a service leader in cloud computing, all we do is hosted computing. To us, the cloud is just the next generation of hosting. And as someone who's been in the hosting industry for 12 years, we feel we're in a unique position to really help bring these two worlds together, these different sets of technologies, and to help companies embrace this new world and this great new tool that allows faster innovation. Not only is it about us being responsive and accountable, but it's about us doing more for you.